This is a layman's edition. What I think is going on in the world of cosmology, science as a whole, from studying the universe. I believe it is important because cosmology underpins every other science. Any changes that transpire will have a huge effect in all of the sciences, including longevity and biology. And that should be important to all of us. I plan on doing a mini-series of videos taking on some of these issues and sharing some of my thoughts with you and perhaps stimulating a debate or learning something from you or maybe you can learn something from me. Basically, I just wanted to share this because I believe it is a serious subject for consideration. Since it's such a wide-ranging endeavor, we're going to take just one or two issues per episode. Facts that I'm going to present to you of our solar system and cosmology, astronomy, the way that I see it. Now, first, I'd like to give you a little information about myself. I'm not a PhD or even have a bachelor's degree. I first became interested in astronomy many years ago. I'd say probably for the first time I was in the sixth or seventh grade and my class took a trip to the planetarium of the high school. Most of the kids were nodding off and being bored. My imagination was running wild. Total interest in all that brilliance that swirls above our heads every night. I wasn't really stimulated into it seriously until I caught, like many, the PBS series Cosmos with Carl Sagan. And for many years, I never missed an episode of that. When VCRs came on, I would tape it. And then once the internet hit, I could watch it any time I wanted. And I caught other shows too, like The Universe and Brian Cox's Wonders of the Solar System and Wonders of the Universe and just about any documentary I could get my hands on and always been an avid reader, not so much of books, but just articles and uh, blogs and things like that. Cosmology has always been at the top of my interest list. I did attempt to take a class in astronomy, but I have to admit, I was severely turned off by the mathematics part of it. Things like the inverse square rule, standard candle, figuring out arc seconds or minutes. But I wanted to learn about the stars and the planets. You know, I didn't want to learn about these things. Unfortunately, they're a prerequisite before you can get anywhere in astronomy. But I've also always been interested in ancient civilizations and culture as well. I never really made any kind of link or connection between the two. But one day when I was poking around on YouTube, and like usual, probably having seen everything twice, I always wondered why nothing new ever comes on, I ran in to a lecture by a man named Wal Thornhill, and it made so much sense to me right away. I just got it. I discovered that there is this major conflict going on in cosmology. You'll never hear about it in the mainstream news. But I was also listening to a lot of ancient, what you would call alternative researchers, like Graham Hancock, Robert Schock, John Anthony West, Michael Sarion, Lawrence Gardner. So I already knew that there was something going on with mainstream Egyptology that didn't make any sense to me. But I didn't really put the two together until I saw the lecture by Mr. Thornhill. And then I learned of one 
Emmanuel Velikovsky, that the two worlds actually collided, no pun intended. Anyway, I saw the presentation by Wall. I believe it was titled Understanding Gravity. But things began to click with me. I've always been intrigued as to just why electricity existed in the first place. But I was hooked on the subject of the electric universe and inspired more than I've ever been inspired by astronomy or cosmology before. I have had a never-ending thirst for more information ever since. When I saw the cosmological quest, well, that just helped convince me more, once and for all, that the standard model as a whole is nothing more than a fairy tale concocted by academia all to support the whole model of uniformitarianism. And it's a big word, but is so deeply entrenched in so many people that they don't even really realize it. The story that this earth has been going around the sun for four and a half billion years without much change. It's just a fairy tale. A revolutionary theory of the universe based on the records of the past has challenged the fundamental beliefs of modern science for more than two decades. Today, the unexpected findings of space explorations have confirmed many of the predictions of this theory, but the man who proposed it, Emanuel Velikovsky, is still rejected by established science. Well, I've taken a lot, but they're not very good. You're in too close for most of them. And if I trans transgressed and went into many fields of science and humanities, it was not because I was born a rebel. I was coerced to trespass. The belief that we are living in an orderly universe that nothing happened to this earth and the other planets since the beginning. That nothing will happen till the end. It is a wishful thinking that fills the textbooks and your textbooks are still of Victorian vintage. Is any physicist here who would stand up and defend the proposition that only gravitation and inertia are in action in the solar system. But of all my heresies, this was the greatest. And let me ask you another question. Is a theory of uniformitarianism, which means that nothing what happens, but happened in the past, could have happened if it doesn't happen today. And this is built the modern geology. And this is built the modern astronomy. And this is built the modern has this biology of and modern theory science. of evolution. And it is and has been virtually in a standstill for over a hundred years. Before, when I would watch Brian Cox's Wonder of the Universe and all the other talking heads talking about 10 dimensions and all these other crazy things. You know, once physics got a hold of cosmology, it seemed like it just turned into something that was dead to me. Uh, this is, uh, I, I don't want to deal too much with this, but this gives you an idea of the sort of uh, rat bag nonsense that you get um, pushed forward as the frontiers of astrophysics. This is the theory of hyperspace. And this is a 10-dimensional universe, whatever that is. It cracked in two, whatever that means, creating two separate universes, a four and a six-dimensional universe. Now, none of that makes any sense whatsoever. But it goes on. Our four-dimensional universe expanded explosively, while our twin six-dimensional universe contracted violently until it shrank to almost infinitesimal size. Does this sound like nonsense? 
And then it goes on, this would explain the origin of the Big Bang. Well, I say rubbish. The very idea of four dimensions and these extra dimensions is in fact a misuse of language. Mathematicians can uh, conjure up as many dimensions as they like. They use this word to, uh, it can mean numbers or it can mean a length on a ruler or they can use it also in terms of the ticking of a clock. But in reality there are only three dimensions because you can't measure time with a ruler. Although we talk about a long time or a short time, we don't actually mean length. So it doesn't make any sense. And this is why, in my opinion, so many books have been written about Einstein's theories of relativity and people still scratch their heads and say, you know, I don't quite get that. And the reason is that fundamentally it doesn't make sense. And I was quickly losing interest. But I thought perhaps it was just over my head and those were certain things that I just didn't understand. But I never really thought it was something that was true just because some guy with letters after his name said so. To me, a PhD used to mean big brain. Now, all it really means to me is that person is just really good at memorization and regurgitation. I have also learned about the right brain, left brain connection and how some people can be right brain thinkers and some people can be left brain thinkers, but how important it is to have the two be equal. And I'm afraid that modern cosmology seems to be stuck in the left brain. I don't know, maybe because I'm somewhat of an artist and it come to me and I'm maybe a little bit more of a right brain thinker, but I gave a lot of this stuff that can't be proven a lot of critical thought. So maybe that's why the Electric Universe made so much sense to me right away. The joke. I never understood how all of these things could be postulated without any way to prove them to be real. Everything's dark, dark matter, dark energy, strange matter, black holes, white holes, you name it. If there's something that needs to be sprinkled in to keep the Big Bang alive, they'll find something else dark. You know, if, if the universe is 99 or 98% dark, then that means that all of us are nothing more than contamination in an isolated universe that just happened to come about, or what they call random collisions in space. You know, I think it's a bit funny that modern science scoffs at the possibility that there's a God because it cannot be proven, but totally willing to accept all these crazy dark things just because it can exist in a math equation. Well, you could most likely come up with a math equation that could to shamelessly borrow a quip from Jim Garrison in the movie JFK, an elephant could dangle off a cliff with its tail tied to a daisy. Common sense tells you that that would be impossible. Modern cosmology is uh, highly mathematical. In fact, we were joking before that about the idea that the only people who understand cosmology are professional cosmologists. Uh, the, the basis of cosmology, really, if you, if you hunt for it, is, lies in Einsteinian relativistic mechanics. And when Einstein promulgated his ideas, he totally and completely ignored anything electric. And so the modern cosmology, with all of its ideas of omega and expanding universe and inflation theory, and the Big Bang and all the rest of it are predicated on a foundation which ignores almost half of man's knowledge about the way the universe works, which is electricity. It may sound like uh, I'm dismissing Einstein and his theories of relativity out of hand, but we have to give Einstein credit for his integrity in pointing out that his theory did not meet his requirements, and that is that it ha his theory had to be tied back to some form of reality. And there is no explanation as to why matter should curve space to give the effect of gravity. 
he felt that quantum theory being uh, a probabilistic theory divorced uh, cause and effect and this is one of the things you cannot do in physics is divorce cause and effect otherwise you might as well give up and get a real job but this is a puzzle that dogged Einstein through his later years to the point that his followers tended to go off and use his geometrical explanations to conjure up things like black holes and uh, neutron stars and so on and the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang without referring back to Einstein who with great integrity said he wasn't satisfied with his explanation. And somebody please tell me why all particle physics equations have to be in Latin is that so they can confuse us even more? For one, mathematics, the way I understand it, can only describe something, but it is really a matter of interpretation of the theoretician. The theory is supposed to fit the model, not the other way around. And simulations? They're only good if all of the information is being fed in. When all of the aspects are entered, not just cherry pick what you want to get in and expect to get a story or the truth. Simulation is not experiment. And yet, simulation is all standard model Big Bang cosmology has. And mathematics, of course. But there is so much information to the contrary that one has to constantly keep up and one lecture can be viewed many times and then still all of the evidence is hard to retain. There is so much of it. imagine having to defend the idea that an infinitesimal speck inside that low to the lower left is producing all of this. The truth is that if you had an elect, uh, electron microscope to look at this image at this scale, you would not see the black hole. And if the image that you did see was brought up and you had another electron microscope to look, you still wouldn't see the black hole. How did it happen that we became so confined theoretically that we are required to look inside that galactic core and ignore the charged particles that constitute a sea of plasma filling this unbelievable volume of space? And it really is impossible to wrap our minds around that. I wish to go through some of these things with you because I have not as of yet found anyone who has made the connection. Because sadly, most researchers, even the mavericks out there, such as Hancock and Schock, to name but a few, still subscribe to the standard model of cosmology, where collisions are all they have because of gravity ruling the universe. Wall Thornhill eloquently puts it, it's the only tool they have in their kit. Wall makes a great prolific case when he says that capture by gravity so just, just get over it. is virtually impossible because there's nothing to act upon the body to slow it down. It'll just slingshot around the sun and go back out again. But if there are electrical forces acting on it in an electrical universe, then orbit and capture can be achieved. Gravity is, after all, 10 to the 39th power weaker than the electric force. That's 1,000 billion 
billion, billion, billion. That seems like a lot. Tesla knew these things when he tried to tell the world what Einstein and Bohr were transforming everything with Einstein's theories and equations. Most people do not understand it, or they don't care, or they blindly accept it as some kind of gospel because they were told to and taught about Einstein's genius in school. So it's really amazing when you see just how deep-rooted uniformitarianism is in every single department of study in the sciences. I had a friend once tell me, of course we don't understand Einstein. We're not supposed to. Wow, really? He didn't really even understand how absurd that statement was. Or was it? Did you ever notice how venomous some people get? When their long-held beliefs are challenged? But they never took the time to research it for themselves. They just accepted it from some unknown source to be true. Never ceases to amaze me. Basically, this is it in a nutshell with the history of how the whole thing came about. In 1915, a patent clerk, imagine that, came up with this theory of gravity Basically, the gravitational forces controlled the universe. Then, for a reason I have no idea why, the guy was given a ticker tape parade in New York. His whole story is not really what you'd think either. Then, this English guru astronomer named Sir Arthur Eddington got a hold of it, and he went all out to prove a point using science and I don't think that's a real good idea but he fashioned the whole dynamics of the core fueled nuclear star which is basically a nuclear bomb going off in space but gravity is holding it all in and together the weakest force in the universe and the existence of the star is a battle between the star exploding and gravity holding it in. As preposterous as that sounds, that is the mainstream belief of what a star is. Never mind the fact that hydrogen, the lightest element, has somehow been able to sink to the core through heavier elements but that the sun is somehow transposing 750,000 tons of hydrogen per second and can do it for billions of years. Does that really make sense when you think about it? Modern cosmology just ignores data or even common sense that does not agree with their belief system. When Hubble made his great discovery, it was for galaxies like our own Milky Way galaxy. And they all followed the same rule, that the fainter they are, the larger their redshift. In other words, the faster they are moving away from us. This is known as the Hubble Law, and directly led to the expanding universe theories. But in the 1960s, there was a new discovery, the quasi-stellar objects often referred to as quasars. 
They appear as star-like points on the sky, frequently blue in color, and they have very, very large redshifts, implying that they are at huge distances from the Earth, at the very boundaries of the observable universe. Some astronomers soon found that a vast number of these strange new objects populated the regions around spiral galaxies and were not only observable with radio telescopes, but were optical and X-ray sources as well. There were two properties of the quasars that were difficult for astronomers to understand using the expanding universe theory. The first was that if one plotted their apparent brightness against their redshifts, as one does for galaxies, one gets an unexpected scatter on the diagram instead of the smooth curve made by the same plot done for galaxies. This seems to indicate that the quasars do not follow the Hubble law as do most other objects, and that there is no direct indication that they are actually at their proposed redshift distances. In fact, it is argued that if Hubble had first been given the plots for quasars, he and other astronomers would never have concluded that the universe was expanding. The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift distances, they must then be the brightest and most energetic objects known to astronomers. So energetic, in fact, that untestable almost metaphysical mechanisms must be applied to explain the phenomena. On the other hand, when placed at their observed distances, that is, in the neighborhood of nearby galaxies, their brightness and energies become normal, and no special mechanisms need to be evoked. This problem has led many astronomers to abandon the idea that all redshifts are due to their speed of recession away from the Earth. And if this is true, then there is no need for an expanding universe, and the Big Bang never happened. In the 1920s, Edwin Hubble and his assistant Hummison found that the nebula they were observing in space were fading away and giving a spectrum orientated toward the red end. At the time, science thought that everything we saw in the Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe. The further away they were, the faster they were going according to this red shift. And somehow the Doppler effect, which is for sound, got transferred into sight. And I have never seen anyone explain how something for sound can be for light. It's two different things to me but that might just be because I don't know. But nobody ever cleared it up for me. One is what you hear, and one is what you see. Anyway, once they got a hold of this information in the 1930s, the front page of the newspapers was, we live in an expanding universe. That was cool all the way up until like the 1960s, when uh, an astronomer named Halton C. Arp came along who actually worked as an underling to Hubble. Anyways, Halt and Arp found these quasars. It was called quasi-stellar objects. were being spit out of these Seifert galaxy cores. They were named after the man who discovered them. But Arp found that these galaxies were connected to these quasars with filament at the time. And still, Mainstream postulates that these quasars, or as they're so known, quasi-stellar objects, are on the fringes of the universe. And Arp says that even though they have different red shifts, they're connected through filaments of plasma to these galaxies. So he writes this paper, and he totally gets shot down by the editor of the Astro Journal, who obviously wields a lot of power because that's who puts their word out to the masses by saying this exceeds my imagination. Well, that gets me. Well, that just defeats everything I thought science was supposed to be about. For his troubles, he was ostracized and basically fired. It took away his telescope time from him. 
He was forced to move to Germany to go to work at the Max Planck Institute and gave him a job. Which was really a godsend because radio astronomers can see all of this plasma when it's in dark mode with their radio telescopes. Why mainstream cosmology, which used to just be astronomy until mathematics took it over and hijacked it, seems to me. You know, that has never really been explained why they would treat him that way. What ARP discovered is that this redshift is more intrinsic, meaning it's due to the object's age and it's non-cosmological than it is with moving away from the Earth. And that defeats the whole expanding universe. And a lot of these people have worked their whole careers for this theory to be just debunked like that. Max Planck himself said that change in science happens one funeral at a time. There's a large body of work going on, observational work, theoretical work, which is based on the assumption that quasars are at their cosmological distances. If it turns out seriously that we're right, then all that work is in vain. We don't know anything like as much as we think we do by saying that, that the quasars are far away. And that's another huge problem for people to face up to. So other problems rear their heads. More dark things get invented. Dark energy, Nobel Prize. Black holes. And then they postulated white holes, which operate exactly the opposite as black holes. Some people have said that science is a wet method for asking questions of nature. And if that's true, then we can say the Big Bang supporters are people who won't take no for an answer. Two or three decades, the Big Bang theory has become increasingly more and more speculative. One expects from a scientific theory definite predictions which can be tested by observations. If the observations disprove the prediction, the theory is supposed to be uh, disproved and uh, it should be modified or abandoned. In science, we work from observation, from empirical observation that starts in the here and now and works outwards and backwards. The Big Bang starts from mathematical formulas, deductions that start from the beginning of the universe and to try and predict it forward. This is the same mathematical approach, mathematical deductive approach that led 2,000 years ago to the development of the Ptolemaic universe. The universe, of course, which was Earth-centered with the planets going around the Earth of the stars in a crystalline sphere. What these theories have in common is that they try and derive what should be the universe based on what perfect principles we can develop, what God should have made the universe to look like. And then they try to fit the universe into that perfect uh, framework. However, what has happened over the years is that Whenever observations have come up which don't agree with the predictions of uh, the Big Bang theory, the theory adds an extra assumption which is not at all tested, which is not at all resting on conventional physics and simply assumes that that must be true. The problem with that is that develops myth, not science. It develops a religious faith in which nothing in the real world, in the observable world, can contradict the faith in this structure, in the Big Bang. This undermines the entire scientific enterprise. The reason science has been valuable to human beings is because it allows us to predict nature in such a way as we can use nature in a predictable fashion and technology 
to abandon this approach, which has served us so well, and to go to the idea that we can deduce, uh, we can read the mind of God, as Stephen Hawking says, and deduce from perfect mathematical principles what the universe must be, is to abandon the scientific method. Okay, dark matter. In the late 1970s, an astronomer named Vera Rubin discovered the stuff at the edges of the Andromeda galaxy was moving just as fast as the stuff near the center, apparently violating Newton's laws of motion, which also govern how the planets move around our sun. While the explanation for that strange behavior didn't become clear until Rubin postulated what was thought to be the first direct evidence of dark matter. I guess it didn't occur to them that there might be something wrong with the theory and not the galaxy. But it seems that it was just a band-aid that was applied to conquer that problem. But that wasn't the first. Check this out. Dark matter was some matter that we don't understand, we don't know what it's about, we haven't observed it, but it isn't ordinary matter, so it doesn't enter into our equations about the light elements, and we can't see it as stars. But dark matter is 90 or 99 percent of the mass of the universe. This is what we call in science a fudge factor, when your equations don't uh, work out, you just write in this little plus something. Well, in this case, this was a humongous fudge factor because it was 90 or 99% of the universe. And you have to not only postulate that this matter has to exist, but it has to exist in quantities much greater than the amount you see of ordinary matter. And I should emphasize that People have looked for dark matter. People have looked for dark matter since it was proposed 20 years ago. Axions, wimps, little particles that are supposed to be floating around in space that we should, in theory, be able to observe as they pass through the Earth. Dozens of experiments have looked for these particles. Not one has been found. Again, this should be a contradiction. The way science works, you make a prediction, Observation contradicts it, the theory should be re rejected, but that hasn't happened. And the epicycles don't end. There's a problem with dark matter, even theoretically, even though we can't observe it, there's still a problem with it, which is dark matter slows down the expansion of the universe. So the length of time that the universe has existed, the length of time since the Big Bang, should be shorter than what's indicated just by linear expansion. But the problem is, it's too short. The prediction of the cold dark matter theory is that the universe should be about 8 billion years old. Well, that's a big problem. We can determine the age of stars in our own galaxy, in the oldest globular clusters, both based on very well-confirmed theories of the nuclear evolution of stars and spectroscopic observation. And the stars in our galaxy are 13 or 14 billion years old. So it's very embarrassing to have 14 billion year old stars in an 8 billion year old universe. <laughs> Okay, and then there's dark energy. It's the term used for a possible unseen influence that may be causing the universal expansion to accelerate, that implies a universe that is about 70% dark energy. In addition, they went into dark energy. Now, why did dark energy come in? Because if you take the present value of the cosmological constant, and the cosmological constant which came out of inflation, you find that they are not the same. Not only they are the same, but you have to find that the difference lies in something like 108 orders of magnitude. 
Now, can you imagine a, a physical theory getting the answers wrong by a factor 10 to the power 108? Yet, the Big Bang cosmologists very coolly accept this and simply put in another epicycle by saying that there is a dark energy which has changed over the time by this factor. So we have to accept that. Dark energy is some force, again, unknown on Earth, unpredicted by any theory that we have validation of here on Earth, that causes an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So as the universe is accelerating, and it's older than appears on the basis of the dark matter theory, and it's 15 billion years old. So we solve the, the uh, problem of the age of the universe by hypothesizing that yet a third completely ad hoc epicycle of dark energy. So now we have a universe which is 70% dark energy, 28% dark matter, and only 2% matter that we can observe through our telescopes and here on Earth. Epicycle is being piled onto epicycle. And in the process, the, what we call the predictive power of the theory is fading away to nothing. One of the most destructive features of the methodology of the Big Bang is that it conveys the idea that only experts understand the universe. Only people versed in extremely complicated mathematics can understand the universe. That if dark matter, dark energy uh, appear to be incomprehensible or even nonsensical, it's because you don't understand the mathematics of uh, these complex equations. This is, of course, the argument of the emperor's new clothes. If you can't see the emperor's new clothes, then you must be either stupid or incompetent. I should mention that three different cosmologies are competing here, but two of them are in major accordance with one another. There is, of course, mainstream Big Bang cosmology, then there is plasma cosmology, and the electric universe. The electric universe and plasma universe agree on pretty much all of the foundations, but there is one major difference as I understand it. That difference is, to my knowledge, that the plasma universe still subscribes to new core stars. The electric universe does not. They offer a whole new paradigm on how stars come into being, and the process they are going through will be in episode two of this series, along with their interpretation of how the solar system came into being. In case you're wondering what the beginning of the universe story is from them, they both say that we still just do not know. But there is no argument that can be made that is not good enough in order to oppose the Big Bang they have to have their own theories on how it all began because there is no way of really knowing that at this point how that took place we are still only in the first microseconds of our existence according to modern cosmology and the last couple to the universe to expect to know all the answers already well, that would just be plain hubris, if you ask me. I admire their honesty and humility on that. There's one difference between the standard model Big Bang Theory and the Electric Universe that I see right off. And it's a big difference. The Electric Universe can and does confirm their theories with experiment they return to classical physics, where the standard model can only describe what they think they see through simulations and math equations, where instead of going back to the drawing board, that they always seem to say, they don't wipe the board clean and start over. They just merely add more equations to support the already torn and tattered theory 
that some say in order to maintain their status and funding. So I wanted to make this first video on the history of cosmology and of the conflict that's been going on for some time now, at least since the 60s. There's always been dissenters. Children in school should be taught who the dissenters were and what they were saying and what the arguments were, but students don't get that option. That's not right. They should. They should know all the details. It's teaching our children and our future generations of scientists to come right now. All I can really ask you to do is to view this subject with a beginner's mind. Weigh the evidence. If you can do that, I think it will be pretty easy to see that modern cosmology has been on the wrong path for over a hundred years. That is just unacceptable. Every other science, especially biology, depends on it. But he was very careful as the discoverer not to make any assumptions and he just called it a, a redshift faintness relationship. Others were less cautious. And the descent of cosmology into ration, irrationality can be traced from the time when they assumed that the redshift was due to the velocity of recession because as soon as you do that, you then give the mathematicians a chance. And they went in and said, okay, we can see these things moving away from us faster and faster. The further away they are, the faster they're going. We can retrocalculate, and we, it all comes back to a point at some time in the past, 12, 15 billion years ago. So the uh, obvious thing is that there must have been a Big Bang. And this is the origin of the Big Bang theory. But you'll notice that the discoverer said nothing about things flying away from us. This idea that uh, things originated in a Big Bang, or from, a, as it was called, a cosmic atom, originated with Georges Lemaitre, a um, Belgian uh, monsignor in the church, Catholic church, and he, it was said that he was trying to reconcile the creation of the universe with Genesis. This is not a good basis for physics. Fred Hoyle derisively called it the Big Bang Theory and the name stuck. But the ancient biblical concept of creation, as I will show, had nothing to do with the birth of the universe. It was the story of the recreation of our little part of the universe after following catastrophe. And then along came the student, an outstanding student of Hubble, probably the best placed person on earth to make this discovery. And he found that these highly redshifted objects, which should have been at the ends of the universe, were actually associated with nearby objects. They were connected to them. And he was able to show, since most of these faint objects are called quasars, the quasi-stellar object, um, he, f he said they're associated with nearby galaxies. They appear to be born from them and then to go into orbit about the main galaxy and gradually become a companion galaxy. In other words, we have an almost biological scenario here. What happened? He had his telescope time withdrawn. He was forced to move to Germany where they gave him an office in the Max Planck Institute which deals with X-ray astronomy. And X-ray astronomy is one of the best places to find out the electrical nature of the universe. Of course, if Halton Arp is right, <clears throat> then it means that objects are intrinsically redshifted. There's something about them 
that causes them to uh, shed their light uh, at a weaker energy than they do on Earth? And this is a question that hasn't been answered. Helton Up doesn't have the answer, but once again we strike this problem. Unless you have the solution, they're not interested in hearing the problem. So it's a, it's a matter of belief. Science is based on belief, just like any other human activity. And don't think it's all to do with logic and evidence and uh, so on, uh, and being perfectly objective. It implies that the universe is much smaller, the visible universe is much smaller than we've been told. It appears to be relatively static, and we can see the generations of galaxies, one born from another. We can see the down to four generations deep. It means that there is probably siblings of our own galaxy, and we'll be able to trace those in future. It gives quite a different picture. This paper was published, um, I don't have the date there, it was just last year and uh, it is more or less the end of the Big Bang, but it hasn't been published yet. When I say it was published, it was printed and it's also available to people to download on the web. Uh, all of these notes, all of these slides are available in full colour, by the way, uh, next door at a small cost, um, and the information is all in there. So we already have the, the hard evidence that the Big Bang is dead. This is just uh, recapitulating what ARP's universe says. It's of unknown size. It's not expanding. Active galaxies give birth to quasars, and quasars grow heavier and brighter to become companion galaxies. The intrinsic redshift is a measure of their age, not distance. The more redshifted they are, the younger they are. But the most surprising thing of all is that redshift is quantized. Now, quantum jumps in energy are supposed to be restricted to the subatomic world. And here we're seeing it at the galaxy scale. What's going on? It tends to suggest that the universe is interconnected. It is interconnected at almost instantaneously.
And what does mainstream cosmology think about all this? Well, they act as though it doesn't exist, of course. Or if they do notice it from their ivory towers. It's just like every other major academic science. They will never engage in a head-to-head -head confrontation. They will only engage in publicly discrediting any non-scientists by scientists or take care of it with invisible pressure tactics. It will be filed under hoax. The enigmatic evidence never having to be dealt with. Even from the uproar that Velikovsky caused, they weathered the storm. Nothing came of it, except for a generation of scientists to come from that and remember. Censorship of forbidden evidence for mankind's great antiquity they call it a conspiracy theory or pseudoscience. Well, that will only work for so long. And they can call it pseudoscience all they want. They can't point out one area where it is. One learns one thing when doing any alternative research, and that is every single mainstream science that uses uniformitarianism as their model is either obtuse, downright ignorant, or corrupt. Probably all three, but one day we will learn our true past.